Bhante Kondanya is a Theravada Buddhist monk who is currently the senior meditation teacher at the Vipassana Meditation Center in Moratua, Sri Lanka. A meditator for 15 years, he was an engineer in the United Kingdom prior to becoming a monk. Bhante tours the West annually, giving teachings and leading meditation retreats. He is thoroughly conversant with English and is known for his excellent rapport with students. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Dear friends, this is a traditional way a monk starts this course. We pay respects to our teacher in the Pali words that I just uttered. It only means salutation to my teacher, the perfect one, the wise one, the compassionate one. For I am only a humble monk, a disciple of the Buddha, a convention he set up 2,500 years ago, the community of monks and nuns, that has up to this moment come down in an unbroken lineage. In fact, one of the old monast oldest monastic orders in the world. I'm only here to share the teachings to one's own experiences, to help you to establish peace and harmony within yourself. Often people would ask, how does one become a Buddhist? But it's very difficult to answer this. Because in, in the very teachings there is no becoming. But in Buddhist countries, traditionally, we use the salutation, I, which I just used a little while ago, plus what we call taking the three refuges. There is no baptism in Buddhism. It is only a way of life, only if you use it, only if you use the teachings, that one could say one is living according to the Dhamma. Dhamma here means the teachings, the guidance and instructions given by the Buddha for human beings to enlighten themselves, to become awake from the slumber of ignorance which they live in. We say Traditionally, buddham saranam gachami, in the language the Buddha himself used 2,500 years ago. This means I go to the refuge of the Buddha. Dhammam saranam gachami, I go to the refuge of the Dhamma. Sangam saranam gachami, I go to the refuge of the Sangha the community of monks, nuns, and lay disciples. This is not a prayer or an appeal to someone, but it's more used as a, a way of making a determination. Now here the going to the refuge of the Buddha means 
not going to the refuge of a person who's passed away. If a person is living, it is easy to go to that person's refuge. But someone who's passed away as long ago, about 2,500 years ago, here when we say we go to the refuge of the Buddha, it means the, the Buddha, the word Buddha implies awakening. Awakening from the slumber of ignorance. Let us examine if one can use the teachings of the Buddha, whether they are still applicable to us. And how can one use these teachings in one's daily life? I would be quite shy to call the teachings of Buddha a religion, because most religions are based beliefs. And I wouldn't want to call Buddhism a philosophy, because philosophy is something that you philosophize, it's not necessarily a way of life. Teachings of Buddha is really a, a way of life that transform a human being from an ordinary human being into an extraordinary human being. Buddha himself, Gautama the Buddha, was an ordinary human being. He was born just an ordinary human being, born as a prince. And he ended up as an extraordinary human being. He reached a perfection that any human being could reach. Whereas his life was a living embodiment of the ultimate perfection of wisdom. He was a living embodiment of compassion, loving kindness, equanimity altruistic joy. And he taught human beings, especially to live and conduct our life in such a way so as to have the maximum joy of one's life. How can we how can this be brought about? What does one have to be to use the teachings? One does not have to call oneself a Buddhist to use the teachings. One does not have to swear allegiance to the Buddha. For he said, to use the teachings to guide you to the arising of wisdom within yourself. Use the guidance and instructions to bring that about without clinging to it, without being a fanatic. Not to become attached to the teaching or to the community of monks and nuns, but to use the teachings and the symbolism wisely to bring about a state of peace and harmony within ourselves. One does not have to give up one's religious practices. One does not have to become anything special. It is actually necessary to become more tuned with the reality. If one wanted to call the teachings anything, I would call it realism. To be aware of the 
the reality of one's self, the body, the mind, the mental states, and phenomena that governs this body and mind process, the phenomena of the world. One of the, the important aspects of the teaching is its attitude. And these teachings are useful to bring about the total transformations of one's attitude to oneself and to others. And specifically, emphasizes that how important it is to establish a lovingly kind attitude towards oneself. Without establishing a lovingly kind attitude towards oneself, it is almost impossible to establish a lovingly kind attitude towards anybody, to without. This is something that one must reflect about. It is almost like if you don't enough earn enough money and have it in your pocket, you don't have anything to give to anybody. If you don't know how it is to be kind to yourself, if you don't know how it is to be patient with one's own shortcomings, how can one establish a patient attitude towards other people's shortcomings? If you, go, if you go about condemning our shortcomings, that would be a disaster because you would project the same attitude towards others' shortcomings thereby never being able to establish any peace or harmony or concord with others. Human beings are a way of getting rid of one's aversions instead of accumulating then day by day, month by month, until it suddenly explodes. And then you have to give up your wife, your husband, your employer, your employee, your friend. It shows us how we can, by using the teachings, learn the art of letting go of aversions, letting go of irritations, letting go of our annoyances from moment to moment without allowing them to accumulate and explode and bring about a complete destruction of peace and harmony to oneself and to others. It is quite normal among human beings especially between husbands and wives and friends, girlfriends and boyfriends, that a little aversion begins in the mind and as days goes by one starts feeding it until after some time the aversions become so strong that you give up your husband or your wife and then you replace it with a new husband or a new wife and the same thing, you go through the same thing. Aversion begins, one indulges in it and accumulates and explodes. And then again, you have to change. But once you learn the art of letting go of aversion, in your daily practice, the practice using the practice of meditation, then you'll find that you can let go of the aversion and still keep your husband or your wife. 
How would you like to do that? The version that arises in your mind is not you. Although we like to think, or we think that it is us. The likes that arise in our mind is not you or me. The dislikes. The dislike is a subtlest form of aversion. This does not this does not mean that one should not have any likes or dislikes. It only means that one should not cling to one's likes and dislikes or identify with them. But just to observe them as likes and dislikes without identifying with them. And through using the art of mindfulness of breathing or what we call the meditation practice, to let go of likes and dislikes when it's necessary, to establish when it's necessary, to let go of views and opinions when it's necessary, even right view, even when we establish right view about something, to learn the art of letting go of that view, because it's only a view and an opinion, it's not a reality. To let go for the sake of peace and harmony within a family, within a group, within an organization. It is one of the main reasons that disrupt peace and harmony within a unit, within people, among people. Clinging to likes, clinging to views and opinions, clinging to likes and dislikes. When it's, when you realize that views and opinions by themselves are not realities, and they're not yours because you've never was born with them. They were views and opinions that you've absorbed or you've been conditioned with. And it is not worth even identifying with them. Relationship is much more important than a view or an opinion because it's only a view and opinion. Views and opinions are not to be thrown away but use wisely, but never allow them to stand in the way of peace and harmony within yourself or without yourself. The teachings very clearly show us by using direct perception through meditation how to purify one's views of its taints and opinions. And having established right view, not to limit it to establishing only a right view, but even learning how to let go of it and replacing it with perfect wisdom. Wisdom, in Tuesday wisdom, the wisdom that is spontaneous, the wisdom that gives us how to use right will, time and place, how to adapt itself for the sake of peace and harmony, how to let go and never to identify with them as once. Because when we go into the history, of how we acquired them, we realize that there are only second-hand views and opinions that we have. We, there's nothing original in the world. Everything is there. 
all these views and opinions that we have in the world have been always there. It's difficult to find something new, original. How did we come to these views and opinions? By our parents? Our education? The media? Peace and harmony within ourselves and without ourselves. Then we can use them. Otherwise, just realize the nature of these thoughts. They arise and pass away. We don't have to identify with them. We don't have to react them. If it's a thought based on a thought based on greed, and we don't need greed, because we human beings only need needs. So if we don't need greed, we just let it go. As it has arisen in our mind, we don't react to it, we don't identify with it, we just let that go. No problem. But if he thinks it's my greed, of course, then I have to do something about it. The same thing do we do with aversion, dislike, irritation. When these thoughts arise, look at them as natural. If you have a human body and mind, and ignorance prevails, and you have been conditioned, then greed, corruption, various forms of these, is bound to arise within us. It's quite natural. One doesn't have to look down and condemn oneself as a sinner because these thoughts arise. All one has to do is just learn the art of just not reacting to this. Bring awareness into it, develop your awareness. When you bring awareness into this, then you realize it's nature. You observe it as nature. You watch the greed arise. You watch the aversions arise. You watch them go. Of religious education, the books that we've read, the films that we've seen, all this, we have learned much. Now to them we have taken a few from here and there, and we've established what you call my view. That's fine. But happens, what happens when we cling to this my view? Just like we start investigating them. How did we come to likes and dislikes? That came because the way we were conditioned. If I was born to a family that used no sugar in tea or coffee, well, I would not acquire a taste of sugar. If anybody put some sugar in my tea or coffee, I would not be able to drink it. And if one of you have been brought up in a family that drank sugar in their tea and coffee, you would not acquire taste without sugar. You would want sugar and in your tea and coffee. And when there's no sugar, you wouldn't be able to drink it. And then if I give you a cup of tea without sugar, you will probably say that you can't drink it. And if I ask you the reason, you'll say, is the sugar. If you give me a cup of tea with sugar, I can't drink it. And if somebody asks me why I can't drink it, I'll say, it's the sugar. So we all think it's the sugar, and somebody I have without sugar, and you have with sugar, and you're happy. But is it really the case? Is it the sugar or the conditioning that we have to sugar? I was conditioned for no sugar. You were conditioned to sugar. That is if you go deeply into it. And the teaching slowly and gradually allows us to investigate 
all our likes and dislikes. And to see the conditioning that we've been conditioned to, conditioned with, and to rise above it, to learn to let go ourselves of that condition, to uncondition ourselves, retain whatever good conditioning there is, let go of the wrong conditioning. Slowly, we'll find that this we can have more and more joy in our life. You're looking at a Buddhist monk, a human being who's using the convention of a Buddhist monk. You may be thinking there's a big difference between the Buddhist monk that's here and you over there. In reality, there is no difference. We are, we are both born and we'll die. We all have bodies, we all need food. What is the difference? The difference is using the teachings of the Buddha. Whenever these thoughts based on greed, hatred or delusion arise from within me, I would not be identifying with them. In your case, whenever the thoughts based on greed, hatred and delusion arise from within you, you'd be identifying with them. You'd be enslaved by them. You'd have to do something about them, because you think they're you. This is the difference. Other than that, there's hardly a difference. Just because one wears a robe, it doesn't mean that there's no greed arising, there's no hatred arising, there's no delusion. It only means that one is working towards that state. Gradually, the forces of greed, hatred and delusion will cease to arise from within this being. One does not have to swear allegiance to the Buddha. For he said, to use the teachings to guide you to the arising of wisdom within yourself. Use the guidance and instructions to bring that about, without clinging to it, without being a fanatic. Not to become attached to the teaching, or to the community of monks and nuns but to use the teachings and the symbolism wisely. Not to become attached to the teaching or to the community of monks and nuns, but to use the teachings and the symbolism wisely.